Good evening and welcome. My name is Ginger Fay, and I'm the Global Director of Partnerships at Appleruth Education. We are thrilled um, that you joined us tonight. We've got a great conversation for you with one of my favorite people in the world, um, Sue Waslick, who is an absolute expert on all things um, <laughs> in my book, um, but in particular, um, she spent over 40 years um, working at our shared alma mater, Duke University, and is affectionately known as Dean Sue um, to all the students that she shepherded through um, their education, including me. Um, so Sue, thank you so much for joining us tonight um, to help students and parents think through major decisions and how to choose their college major and what it means and maybe what it doesn't. Um, so uh, if you have questions tonight, I hope you'll put them in the Q&A box. We'll be glad to cover as many of your interest, uh, your questions, your topics as we can in the next hour. Um, we will be recording this presentation and you will receive a copy of this presentation and the recording later this week. Um, so if you're not able to take notes while we're speaking, that's A-OK. -okay. Um, but we appreciate the chance to, to join you in conversation. As I mentioned, I work at Appleruth, um, which is an education company that supports students in lots of different ways. Um, and that's why we do programs like this, um, because we really want to share good ideas and information as students are embarking on their own journeys in education. We are founded in the fundamental belief that when you change a student's self-belief, you can change their life. Um, students who believe in themselves are able to accomplish the things that are possible for them. And so we teach a lot of things, um, but what we're really trying to do is teach students to believe in themselves. Um, the things that we do teach are academic tutoring, standardized test prep, and executive function coaching. Um, so we help students um, who might be struggling in class or want some enrichment work um, anywhere from early elementary through college. Um, we also help students who are embarking on a high stakes uh, standardized test. Um, be that the SAT or ACT if they're going to college, the GRE if they're going to grad school, the SSAT if they're applying to high school. Um, we also do executive function coaching, which helps students put it all together um, so they can um, organize their work and themselves. Um, so tonight, we're going to focus in a little bit on one of those big questions. So what do you want to be when you grow up? Um, this is a conversation that Sue has led for lots of different groups at different times. And I'm so excited that she was willing to bring this conversation to us here at Apple Ruth. Um, before we get started, um, Sue, I wanted to ask um, if we could launch a quick poll um, so we can get to know our audience a little bit. We'd love to know if you are a student or a parent or an educator um, and if you are a student or representing a student where that student is in the process. Um, so if you would let us know, um, we would appreciate that. Um, and we'll answer more questions than we ask, but that's the first one that we wanted to ask. And we um, did enable closed captioning. Um, so if it's more helpful to you to read a transcript of this, I hope you'll take advantage of that. At Apple Ruth, we believe a lot in um, neurodiversity and supporting students who learn different Differently. And so we want to be able to give you a variety of ways to um, experience this webinar. Um, so thanks so much for participating in the poll. That's enough preamble from me. Um, so Sue, I'm going to let you tell us um, what we want to be when we grow up and how we can figure that out. So I'm going to turn the tables here for a second, Ginger, and I want you to pretend that you are uh, back at being a 17 year old. And if I had asked you this question, what do you want to be when you grow up? What would you have said? Okay, so I am the only person who ever has answered this question this way, but I did really want to work in admissions. Um, I what do you went even to know college. about college admissions? Well, I went to visit colleges. My parents took me on and my grandmother on a journey um, cross country. We put 2,500 miles on the car in two and a half weeks. And we visited, I think, every accredited four-year institution any of us had ever heard of. And I didn't really figure out where I wanted to go to college on that trip, but I did figure out that um, people who worked in admissions were really generous and interesting people who listened to young people. And I didn't experience a lot of that when I was growing up, adults caring what young people had to say. And I said, and I think young people have really interesting ideas. I thought we did then. I think they do now. And so I just said, I want to be that kind of grown up. I want to be an adult who listens to young people. So I don't, I've worked in admissions and college counseling for more than 25 years. And I don't know anyone else who ever thought that they wanted to do that when they were 17, but I did. And I was very, very fortunate um, that I got to do that as my very first job out of college. But most of the time, 
when you ask a student, I, when I see adults asking students, what do you want to be when you grow up? I think they're looking for ideas because um, most grownups haven't figured it out yet. So if I were asking a 17 year old version of you, what you wanted to be when you grew up, what would you say? Yeah, and I want to go back a little bit in my life because I vividly remember the first time that I was asked this question and I was in the second grade and we had to write um, a one, one or two paragraphs. It was a very short um, paper and I remember it had to, I remember it was printed because we weren't quite uh, up in speed yet to cursive writing. Um, but I remember it vividly and I, I went home to think about it because um, I was from a family where my brother and I were first generation in college. So we didn't have a lot of role models in terms of people that we could think about, like, do I want to be like this person or this person do, you know, and it's because no one in my family had gone to college. And so uh, most folks were just it was working class family. <clears throat> and I couldn't decide between writing about being a teacher um, because I knew teachers and I felt like that was something that maybe I would like to do or could do. And the only other thing that I could think of, and please don't laugh too loudly, Ginger, when I say this, um, but I actually wrote about wanting to be a nun. And one of the reasons that not being a nun appealed to me is that I wouldn't have to worry about what I was going to wear every day. Um, my, it's a my, real plus to that career choice. My right. outfit was going to be determined for me. And I don't mean to say that in a snarky or frivolous way, but it was one of the things that went through my head that there would be just a lot of stress taken off. And I knew that I would have a place to live and a place to eat. Um, I didn't really think about what it meant to be a nun, but I just knew those things about being a nun. Let's fast forward very quickly out of the second grade. Um, and by the time I was about 12 years old, I was convinced that I was absolutely without question going to be a doctor because doctors helped people. And that's what I wanted to do. And I became quite obsessed with many of the television shows about doctors, um, you know, the Marcus Welby types. Um, and then as we get more into the modern world, ER, and I still have found Grey's Anatomy, Anatomy to be quite um interesting and enjoyable at times. Um, needless to say, I'm not a doctor. But what I do know, and I know we'll talk about this in just a second, I do know that this question about what do you want to be when you grow up? And what do you want to study when you go to college has, I believe, created increasing levels of anxiety and stress in students over the last several years. We ask this question as though people know the answer or should know the answer. And I think that really does create some uh, pretty significant angst for people, for students. Um, so maybe we can talk a little bit before um, we're done about maybe different ways to ask people about their interests, but let's get back to this notion of choosing a major. Does it really connect in any way to an ultimate career? For folks who are watching, parents, um, maybe we even have some current college students. I don't, I don't know who's on this webinar right now, but I'd be um, interested in everyone sort of reflecting on those who have had a major or currently have a major. Um, where does it sort of fit, or has it fit in your career? Um, because at the end of the day, I would argue that there really is very little connection and there doesn't need to be a significant connection. So that's the beginning of the story. That's the end of the story. Let's kind of talk about the middle. <clears throat> or maybe people just want to jump off right now. And now that they <laughs> now that they know the end of the story, I do like asking students, particularly high school students that are starting that college process and that college selection process, just to ask themselves a few questions. And I think there are four questions that I would suggest that students ask themselves, and maybe even parents again on this webinar, would like to ask themselves this question and see where it gets them. So let's start with question number one. What is your favorite subject in school? What was your favorite subject in school? This is in school, meaning not college, but primarily in high school. Was there a subject that you really, really, really liked? And I'm real, I'm I'm directing this question right now more to people who are getting ready to go to college or thinking about college, um, or maybe even a freshman in college who has yet to declare a major. But 
Was there a favorite subject in school and why did you like it? And so many students, when I ask them this question, they'll say English or history or biology or whatever. Why did you like it? I really liked my teacher. And I think that that's a, um, a strong answer. I think that that's a really interesting answer to reflect on because frankly, I think that that's as good a reason to major in something in college is that you have found a professor or two that you really, really like. Their classes just energize you um, in a way that others don't. And suddenly a subject that you had no idea you were interested in is now your favorite because you found someone who can teach it to you in a way that makes it alive and really brings it alive. So a reason to major in something, like one of the best reasons to major in something, because you like it, you just like it. And so trying to figure out what you like, what you like to read about, what you like to think about, what you like to write about and study is as good a reason to pick a major as any. I just like it. But a lot of people don't find that to be a satisfying way to approach this question. So a second thing that you might consider is if college were not an option, it's just off the table, suddenly you can't go anymore. Um, and I actually had lunch with a student today, a Duke student, a second semester freshman, and I asked her this question. Um, what would you do, again, legally, to support yourself if I told you right now you can't stay at Duke? You just can't continue to go to college. You can't go anywhere. Um, and she gave an answer um, that came, she answered it very quickly, and she said, I would wait tables. Um, that's something that I've done in the summer. I like interacting with the public. Um, I like making people happy. And usually when you bring people coffee or food or ice cream or whatever the case might be, um, you bring some pleasure into their lives. And I know that I can do that. And I know that I can make good money doing that. And so I asked her if she felt like those particular tasks were connected in any way to something that she might major in. And she thought about it for a second. And then she said, well, I'm going to answer that question in a second, but I'd really like to answer another question. And I said, okay. She said, I'd like to tell you what I would do um, long term if I couldn't go to college. I said, great. That's even a better question. What would that be? She said, you know, I think I'd be a flight attendant. I love to travel. I love to go to different places. And along the way, I would really like to try to learn different languages because I love learning language. And she said, I can do that without going to college. I said, you're absolutely right. I said, when you think about this notion of waiting tables or being a flight attendant and traveling, does that in your mind connect to something that you could study in college or that you are currently studying in college? She said, yeah, I'm really enjoying my psychology class. Um, I'm really liking it. I said, what about it do you like? And she said, I really like my professor. And she said, I really like learning about people because I do think that learning about people and le learning about why we behave the way that we do and why we think the way that we do can be connected to so many different careers. So I thought, wow, I need to bring her on this webinar tonight and just let her answer these questions because these are great, great questions. She came to college undecided, completely undecided, and she's going through that process of trying to decide right now. And I was pleased that she was pretty calm about all of that um, and has some great answers. But this is the second question that I would just invite people to think about. If you couldn't go to college, what would you do to support yourself? And there's so many things that you can do without going to college. <clears throat> Not suggesting people to go. What do you want to be or do when you grow up? It's just one of those questions that we, um, we just asked each other. Um, we ask people all the time. Um, and I think it's a reasonable question to ask. But I don't think that you rely on the answer necessarily to this question to help you determine your major in college. But it might be a decent jumping off point, and it might be one of several things that you want to consider when you are deciding on a college major 
But what I would absolutely discourage people from doing, and we're going to talk about this numerous times throughout the webinar, is your college major is not necessarily and rarely connected to once you event, what you eventually do when you do grow up. But I think it's a reasonable question to ask and answer um, nonetheless, but it's not the only question that should be asked and answered. And then question number four <clears throat> is, if you had to decide today, what would you select as your college major and why? <clears throat> um, and it's just, again, one of those um, uh, sort of time sensitive questions because many of you are gonna be applying to college soon. And you're going to probably have to answer that question on a college application. Before you answer it, though, I would really encourage you to answer why. Why are you putting that down on your application? And I know Ginger's going to talk a little bit about this um, in just a minute. So I'm going to defer saying any more about this fourth question and go on to our next slide and, and um, sort of tie this into what we've said <clears throat> um, or what we will say later on. So your major matters a lot or not at all. That's kind of the theme of um, this webinar. But I would say that the latter part of this, that your major matters really not at all, except it needs to be something you really, really like to study. Um, I would ask the parents who are on this um, webinar, did you really like your major? I hope you did. Some of you may have selected a major because you thought it was going to eventually uh, link you to a particular career. I would ask you, did it? If it did, how did that happen? If it didn't, why not? Did your major matter in your first job more than it's mattering now? Or maybe it never mattered at all. But there are some times when your major does matter. Um, and there are a number of careers and professional opportunities that may require some type of licensure or certification, testing, whatever the case might be. And so you will likely need to major in a particular field in order to get that certification and that licensure. Um, we've listed four here, engineering, nursing, architecture, and teaching. Accounting could be a potentially a fifth. Um, but frankly, there are very few. Um, these four, the fifth one accounting, are all certainly very important ones. <clears throat> um, but I also know a lot of people in each and every one of these, these areas who may not have done what they needed to do at the undergraduate level to get these licensures, to get these certifications. And again, we'll mention later, there are ways to do that even after college or later in college. So it does matter. <clears throat> but not too much and not always. Some of the ways I would mention just in, I think in terms of that your major doesn't always matter um, is because graduate schools do not necessarily expect you to come having majored in a field that's related to what you wanna study in graduate school. I think there's a perception that you have to major in something that's related to what you wanna do in graduate school and that's not necessarily true. Um, when I was in admissions at Duke, we used to joke that the um, department that had the, high, the best track record for med school admissions was in fact the art history department. Um, they had a hundred percent acceptance rate and the biology department was not that high. <laughs> um, um, so sometimes you make a more interesting applicant to a graduate program if you have explored other things that are interesting to you along the way. Um, so it is not necessary to major in something that sounds like your graduate school, um, you can if you want to. If those are things that you enjoy, and if you're if you are applying to um, hoping to apply to medical school, um, there are eight classes that you have to take, and they fall pretty neatly within a biology or a chemistry major. But that doesn't mean you have to do that as a major. You can you can choose something else. Another thing I think that's important to note is that your employer will want to teach you how to do the job the way they want you to do the job. Um, so if you majored in something like broadcast journalism and you learned how to use the equipment that your school has, the job that you get at a network might have very different kind of equipment and need to retrain you anyhow. 
Um, and then the third thing that I think is worth noting is that a lot of people are doing work today that did not exist when they were in college. And so um, Sue and I have a really <laughs> strong belief that if you um, pursue a liberal arts education and you learn the how to learn, which is um, what a, a liberal arts education is trying to teach you, that will serve you well, even as technology changes um, and can make different jobs irrelevant um, <laughs> over the course of what would be your working career. Um, so having the core education um, in the liberal arts is a, is a very valuable way to stay flexible um, because you'll continue in your journey in your career and you might try several different things, many of which we don't even know what they are yet. Um, Sue had asked me to talk a little bit about the application process um, since I've worked on that side of things. I've worked in admissions at Duke and I have read applications for Emory, the Coca-Cola Scholars and the Jack Kent Cook Scholarship Foundation. Um, and so I wanted to give a little bit of advice and a little insider's look at the application process and whether or not you're de it is valuable or advisable to declare a major, an interest area on your application. Almost every application asks students what field they plan to major in or what they want to explore in college. Very few of them are gonna hold you to that. Um, nobody comes to you at graduation and says, you know, it says right here on your application that you wanted to major in biology and you're graduating with a degree in culture and anthropology and you didn't know what that was when you were 17. So you have to go back and start over because that's not what we admitted you for. That doesn't happen. Um, <laughs> so, um, so it's, uh, while they ask the question, they don't necessarily plan to hold you to the answer. That said, there are some colleges that admit students by college, the undergraduate college within the whole university, or a specific major. Um, state universities are more likely to do that um, than a small private liberal arts college. And often if you've been admitted to a specific program, be that a major or a college, undergraduate college, you usually have to stay in that program for your first year um, before you can transfer within programs of uh, within the school that you've attended. Um, there are universities that have multiple undergraduate colleges that have different levels of selectivity within them, and that can make it tempting to think that you should position your application because you want to go to that umbrella university that you should position your application for the undergraduate college that has the highest acceptance rate. Um, they're on to that. <laughs> um, they know that they know their statistics too. And so what they're looking for in each of those undergraduate colleges is for students who are a really strong and authentic match. Um, you are not the first person who wanted to go to Penn who thought maybe I'll apply to nursing instead of Wharton. Um, if you want to study business, you're not going to be a strong candidate for the nursing school. Um, um, and part of the reason why those acceptance rates can be a little bit higher in some of those specialized programs is because it's self, such a self-selected group um, that has already done the discernment pro process to figure out that that's what they want to major in. One thing I do want to talk about a little bit, and I know Sue wants to talk about this as well, is um, sort of the plight of the undecided student. Um, the most popular major at any college is undecided. Usually about half of the students are theoretically majoring and not knowing what they want to major in yet. Um, but you just because you're not sure of what you want to do doesn't mean that you don't have interests. Um, it doesn't mean you're clueless. Um, it doesn't mean that you're disinterested. It just means you haven't chosen yet. That openness is something colleges really enjoy about students, but it can make it hard to pitch yourself in the admissions process as a strong match for the school if you, if you don't identify an area of academic interest that matches up with a strength of the college or university. Um, so it's helpful if you can kind of look into your interests a little bit, ask some of those questions of yourself that Sue is suggesting at the beginning. You don't have to necessarily declare a major on the application, but it is good to be able to identify the things that you're interested in pursuing and that means you've found a match with the college that you're applying to, that they have pathways for you to explore the things that are interesting to you. Um, so a few tips, I guess, um, from someone who's been there and done that and read about 60,000 um, essays at this point. Um, if you have a clear interest in a field and all signs in your application point to that, you should say it. Um, so if you have been doing independent research in science and you're taking AP biology and you volunteer, you do the volunteer program at your um, 
local hospital, you're pre-med and you shouldn't say you're not <laughs> um, or pretend that you're not interested in that. Now, I will mention that pre-med, pre-anything, pre I want to go to graduate school is typically not a major because um, it's not an academic pursuit. It's just a goal you have um, and you can indicate that or not. Um, so if you have a clear interest and your whole application is kind of making that persuasive argument, then absolutely it should be noted on your application. If, however, your area of interest is um, what I would call an unexplored hypothesis, um, because you just really like Grey's Anatomy and it looks cool. Um, and you can also, it comes with a uniform, just like you know being a nun, you get to wear a ja white jacket every day, it goes with everything. Um, and so you think that that's your future, but you haven't tested that hypothesis yet, your application will be weakened by emphasizing something that isn't strong. Um, so if you say, this is what I think I wanna major in, or this is what I'm thinking about pursuing, you're basically shining a spotlight on that part of your application. And so you wanna make sure that part of your application is ready for the solo, right? That it's ready to be on stage by itself. Um, and so if it is, mention it, if it's not, don't. You can have goals for yourself that aren't in your application. That's fine. There was no major called pre-admissions officer. Um, so I had, to figure, I had to explore and try some other things. I could have a professional goal for myself, but it didn't necessarily have um, to guide my path uh, through the academics um, and through my curriculum. Um, a second piece of advice is to make sure that the college you're applying to actually has the major that you're saying you want. Um, so on the Common Application, which is a, an, a one application platform, there are lots of others, um, but that's accepted by over a thousand colleges, so a lot of students use it. Um, you, every time you submit the Common Application, you're submitting a unique application to a school, so you can change some things um, to match up with that particular school. Um, so please make sure that you are naming as your major of interest, something that the college you're applying to has and calls it the same thing you're calling it. Um, so for instance, if you're interested, let's say in international relations, that's something that goes by a lot of different names at different schools. Um, so rather than just kind of saying once it's IR, I'm definitely doing international relations, but applying to lots of schools that don't necessarily have that as, as a major by that name, you really look as a as an admissions reader, you look like a student who hasn't really done your homework on the school and you are not a perfect puzzle piece then, you know, that sort of matches up well. So that's a place to be really careful. Um, and uh, the last thing that I just wanted to mention is that while the major, and I had mentioned this a little bit before, while the major that you put on your application may not be necessarily relevant, the undergraduate college that you're applying to is something that is a fixed choice. Um, so if, you know, at Duke, there's just the undergraduate, the, there are only two undergraduate schools, the engineering program and arts and sciences, um, and you're on a path from the first day um, for one of those or the other, and your application is evaluated based on your readiness for that path. Um, so the college matters, the undergraduate college that you're applying to matters, but the major may or may not matter as much. So that's my tales from the front. Um, so Sue, can you tell us a little bit about how students can explore some of the things that they're interested in while they're still in high school or in college? Yeah, and we've we've touched on a little bit of this already to some extent, but I think this this um, self awareness is really important in trying to do um, really a self reflective self assessment type of exercise um, to try to figure out what really motivates you, what motivates you to read and write and study. Um, you know, you may love watching Grey's Anatomy, but you hate chemistry or you hate biology, or you hate physics, or whatever the case might be. Um, and so you've really got to find where you get that intellectual spark. And what kind of books do you like to read? What kind of authors? Where does that motivation come from? Um, one of my colleagues who helped, uh, was a co-author of um, Getting the Best Out of College that we wrote a number of years ago, he would suggest to students um, that they think about the New York Times newspaper. Now, you know, people don't really use hard copy newspapers anymore. I do still um, actually subscribe to the local newspaper here in Durham, North Carolina. Um, but 
I only get it two days a week that way. But if, if you were to think about picking up the Sunday edition of the New York Times, which section of the paper would you grab first? Would it be theater? Would it be food? Would it be sports? Would it be politics? Would it be travel? Um, does that tell you something about what kind of motivates you in terms of just learning more and reading? Um, certainly use the Career Center to take any kind of self-assessment tests that they might offer. And there are so many of these. We've listed two here, but there are a number of them. Take these. Maybe you have an opportunity to take some of these assessments in high school. Don't take one, take several. Um, and just try to figure out what's important to you. What do you value? What can you learn about your personality? And what might it tell you about what you enjoy studying? And you certainly want to utilize your guidance counselor in high school. Um, and there are still, there are resources available through your guidance counselor. We've got two listed here, um, use science or what color is your parachute? Again, um, ways to sort of help you figure out what you like to study, what you like to do, and trying to marry those two. Try to interview people that you know, um, adults that you know, people that you know that really like their jobs currently and don't. Were there courses that they took that they think really helped them in the job that they have? Did they major in something that they think is, in fact, really connected to what they're doing? That's probably going to be the case if they are one of those licensed certified people that we talked about earlier. Um, but they they may tell you I've ch they've changed jobs several times. Why did they change? But just try to learn. And gosh, one of the greatest things that you can do um, is shadow them. And um, I know that even in undergraduate schools, medical schools are looking to see if you've shadowed doctors at some time during your undergraduate career, just to make sure that you know what you're getting um, them, getting yourself into. And um, in any event, that shadowing is really good. And then get some work experience. If you can figure out a way to do some internships, to do some volunteering, we just talked about shadowing. Um, it's very helpful to be able to get your hands dirty in some of those areas before you commit in a big way. So self-assessment, um, talking to people who are in jobs already that you think might be interesting to you, just learning more about it, and then trying to get some hands-on experience. This is just interesting. This is just fun. Um, you can do this with your family. You can do this with people in your neighborhood. Um, you know, you can do this with, with whomever. But if we take a look at some famous people that hopefully we all know, it's just kind of interesting to see what did Will Ferrell major in in college? Um, I don't know. What did he? Sports information. Um, I didn't know there was a sports information major, but I guess there is somewhere. Uh, Queen Latifah. <clears throat> Broadcast journalism. There is certainly some connection to what she ultimately, ultimately ended up or has ended up doing in her career with acting. John Legend, I don't think was a music major. He was an English major, which maybe has helped him write some music. I don't know, but um, Ava Longoria. Oh my goodness, I have no idea. What does she major in? Kinesi, kinesi, I can't say this word. Kinesiology. Kinesiology. Um, but she, I guess she didn't end up really becoming like a physical therapist type person or doing anything in medicine. Eli Manning, one of my favorite, favorite people in the whole wide world, marketing. And he and his brother are certainly doing a lot of marketing related kind of work now, and they are very good at it. Our former president, Barack Obama, predictable political science. And I think we have one more maybe, John Stewart, funny man, <clears throat> psychology. So again, I wonder if any of these people, maybe Eli Manning, Mary, maybe Barack Obama, I don't know, had some vision of what they wanted to do, or maybe all of them did. But we can see here that there was not necessarily a direct link. There are a few exceptions on this list, but a super direct link between what they majored in in college and what they eventually ended up doing. <clears throat> so the moral of the story, 
Your major does not need to lead directly to your career. There may be some connections. There may be some things that your major can help you do during your career, but you don't necessarily have to feel as though if you major in biology, you're going to be a biologist. If you major in English, you're going to be a writer. Um, if you major in psychology, that must mean you're going to eventually be a therapist. Um, that's just not the case. And there are zillions of examples of people all around you that can prove this particular moral of the story. So if the major isn't important, what, why are you going to college? Like, what, what are employees looking, employers looking for? And why is it that many employers aren't going to hire you without a college degree? And these are really the seven things that I believe you should attempt to achieve in a deliberate way while you're in college. And you can achieve these seven skills, abilities, um, through any major. Any academic lens will enable you to become a better critical thinker, to be able to really critically think about what an issue is all about, how to take it apart, how to analyze it, leading to your ability to solve problems. Number two, one and two are so important today in any job that you might have, being able to critically think and problem solve. You need to be able to speak. You need to be able to write effectively. You need to be able to read. You need to be able to demonstrate that you can work on a team, that you can work independently. And most significantly, you have to be able to show that you've been able to be successful in some area. That doesn't mean you have to be perfect. It also doesn't mean that you should never fail. In fact, being able to talk about your failures during a job interview is some of the most powerful thing, one of the most powerful things that you can do. But this demonstration of success, um, all the data shows that you are able to generally demonstrate success uh, in a more vivid and consistent way if you're studying something that you really like, that you really enjoy. So why go to college and try to become a critically thinking, problem-solving, well-spoken, well-writing, team player, independent worker, and a successful person? Why not do that while studying something you really, really like? And my suggestion to you is if you do that, you will develop all these skills and you will really enjoy your college experience and you will be enormously happy um, and feel quite purposeful, frankly. <clears throat> um, just some observations. I think I mentioned earlier increased anxiety about just being asked the question, so what are you going to do after you graduate? Um, you might want to think about rephrasing that to, to graduating seniors and just saying, so, you know, what do you think is next? Um, do you have any thoughts about that? How might I, I help you um, as someone who has gone to college, think about what might be next? Um, we also know that there is sort of this um, paralysis that comes when you have too many options and too many things to think about. So try to narrow those options as best you can moving forward. But don't feel that your major can should limit those options, but it can help focus your vision. Just keeping in mind that some of the times what you loved to study might have, in fact, some kind of link to what you ultimately do, but it doesn't necessarily have to. <clears throat> A few things about advice. Um, if you enter college and you are sure at that moment, which I, of course, was when I was 18 years old that I wanted to be a doctor, um, I entered that pre-professional, that pre-med track. Um, I'm not sure that I allowed myself to fully discover other interests along the way. Um, it was fascinating to me that my education courses were some of my favorites. I loved my religion class. And I actually also loved a poetry class that I took. But I would never have imagined majoring in English or religion. Um, 
But today, if I had to go back and redo it, I probably would. Um, if you need to take some extra time to graduate, I know this is not a bullet that really excites parents as they read it because we see dollar signs take extra time to graduate. That means more tuition dollars. Um, but it may be that you do have to transfer to another school or change your major simply because it took you a little bit more time to figure it out. It's frankly better to take that extra time and major in the thing that excites you the most than it is to just try to finish and graduate um, in this four-year magical time um, with the, quote, wrong major, the major that you really didn't like. Um, make certain that you also look to your co-curricular and your extracurricular activities to inspire you and to make you think about what possible careers you might like. I hate to keep talking about Duke, but it does, in this case, provide a, a really nice example. Duke does not have a journalism school. We never had. I don't think we ever will. We do have a journalism sort of focus that you can take in our public policy school. I cannot tell you how many graduates of Duke go into journalism and they've not done any coursework related to journalism, but they have done significant extracurricular activities related to journalism and they're working in that field. So again, don't just see your major um, what you're studying, anything being the only thing, and of course, I've already said all along, it shouldn't be, frankly, the, the driving force here, but sometimes your extracurricular activities are really the ones that are going to be able to highlight for you what your ultimate career options might be. Um, and finally, I think I've said uh, a number of times, um, do what makes you happy. Sometimes that's really hard um, for parents to swallow and for students to actually share with their parents, I'm going to major in music. And the parent immediately has a vision of that child playing in a band in the garage. You know, how are they going to make a living? How am I, what is that going to look like? Um, Ginger mentioned that medical schools love majors in art history. They also love music. They also love religion. Um, they also love cultural anthropology. Um, because all of those things provide a lens into the human experience that you can sell. And you can sell yourself with all kinds of majors for all kinds of careers, particularly if you enjoyed it and they made you happy. Thank you, Sue. I think that's all excellent advice. Um, and I have been the grateful recipient of a lot of your good advice over the years. Um, we're going to take questions. Um, and I think we've got a lot coming into the Q&A box now. Um, just a reminder, if we can help you at Apple Ruth, we do a lot of academic tutoring. And it's, um, believe it or not, time to start getting ready for APs if you're a senior in, or a junior in high school. Um, we are gearing up for our winter testing weekend, which is um, a weekend when we do some free practice tests um, for the SAT or ACT. And we'd be glad to sign you up for that. Um, or you can get started on executive function coaching with us. So please let us know if we can be of help to you along the way as you try and figure out what it is, what it is you want to do and, and how you, how you want to pursue it. Um, Sue, I would wanted to ask you a question um, because you were an academic advisor for a lot of students, some of whom are quite famous now because um, they're MBA players, um, but you, you were uh, the academic advisor for a lot of students um, when you were working at Duke. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about some of the classes you would recommend students take. Yeah, and I'm actually still an academic advisor. I only currently have five advisees, and um, all of them are in the process of declaring their majors right now, um, which has been a fun time to be with them and to try to help them along the way. But I do think that there are some courses that just make sense to try to take in college. Um, and sometimes these courses have really interesting, good professors. And uh, I just think regardless of where your life may end up taking you, what that adventure looks like, I always advise um, my students to think about taking an accounting course. I know that sounds really bizarre and kind of strange. And that accounting class may be under a business school or a business major. 
It might actually be under an accounting major. It might be taught in an economics department, but a introduction to financial accounting, um, just so that you have a better understanding of sort of the difference between assets and liabilities, um, if income and revenue versus expenses, I think everybody ought to have just that basic knowledge of business um, and of accounting. I would also highly recommend that students, if they can take a public speaking course. Um, you know, we're all called upon each and every day to speak in one capacity or another. I have yet to talk with a student who has taken a public speaking course who hasn't said it was a difference maker for them. Um, it forced them to do some things that they frankly tried to avoid in some of their other classes. You know, they would sit in the back, they never raised their hand, um, they would not engage in discussion and conversation, they wouldn't answer questions. And when you take a public speaking course, you can't avoid it. And I would tell you that I, I think just being able to answer questions in an impromptu way, being able to engage in conversation um, in social events and what have you, being called upon in a meeting, whatever career you might have, that public speaking class is really going to make a difference. Um, so, so many students right now are majoring in computer science. We know why. Um, computer science at many schools used to be the least desired major, and it has moved up very quickly in the last three, four, five years to the number one major at a number of schools, whether it's a state school, a, a smaller liberal arts school, it doesn't matter. It looks like the whole world is thinking that you need to major in computer science. Um, I don't think the whole world needs to major in computer science. But I do think having some experience in an introductory level uh, computer science class makes sense. The problem with computer science right now at many schools, and I don't mean to be dissing computer science because there are some great professors out there, some great classes, some great departments, but they've grown so quickly that some of the classes are really, really big right now. Um, but if you can take an introductory level computer science class, um, I would, I would highly recommend it. It's hard for people to believe that, that I took computer science in high school, in a public high school in North Carolina, but I did, um, and I'm glad I did, and I ended up taking an introductory level computer science class in college, and I'm glad I did. But maybe it's not computer science that you want to sort of learn about. If it's not that, then I would say taking some kind of data science class understanding data today and understanding and having some data called data fluency, um, I think is really, really important. I used to always suggest to students they take a statistics class, but maybe if it's not statistics, it's more of a data science class so that you have a better understanding of how data is used. Um, I have heard from um, coaches, a number of college coaches, that this notion of data analytics and them being able to understand data and because you know they're getting now just notebooks filled with what do you do on fourth down in a football game, three yards to go, you're on the 20 yard line. They now have data that tells them what they should do in that situation. Now, not all of them do it because they don't always follow the data. But having some understanding of data, I don't care what your major is, I think is a really, really important thing. Um, so some accounting, public speaking, statistics or data analysis, and perhaps some kind of computer related course. Um, I'm always also really big on taking a writing course. Many schools are, are requiring you to take some kind of writing. Um, and I think having some history course is really important, but that just may be this old lady coming out of me saying, let's not forget our history.
Thank you, Sue. I, when I was a college counselor, I, I was a college counselor at Phillips Academy in Andover, Massachusetts and um, several other places. And I used to, with my students, talk about their first semester in college and what how to pick their classes. Because I found a lot of um, parents were encouraging students to, and I quote, get their requirements out of the way, um, which makes for a pretty brutal and unenjoyable freshman fall, I will say. Um, and so I developed a little strategy for teaching students to pick their classes for the semester, if I can share it with this audience, um, which is to basically try and build your, your courses like it's a meal. Um, so you typically only take four or five classes a semester when you're in college, and that was a big surprise to me, um, and no one's telling you what you have to do. Um, they don't necessarily tell you the order in which you have to do them unless you go to a school that has a core curriculum and, a, and you know, they're sort of like, this is what you take and, and for two years, don't ask us any questions. Um, but a lot of schools give you a, a great deal of latitude on, on what to take. And so I think every semester should have an entree class. Um, that's a class that's something that's meaty um, or mushroomy um, if, you're, if you're a vegetarian, um, but something that's substantial that you can really sink your teeth into. So that might be something that you're thinking about majoring in um, for your early semesters in college. Maybe that's an introdu introductory level class to something like psychology or economics that you're considering as a major. So that's one sort of entree. Then you should have, you know, a leafy green. You should have, you know, some kale, some spinach. Um, you should have a class that maybe you're not necessarily looking forward to, but you do need to take as a requirement. But that's only one out of the four. Not the whole plate of kale is kind of intimidating. Um, then you should have like a sweet potato, um, <laughs> which is a requirement that you're excited to do. Um, so it's like a, you know, something that's tasty and good for you. Um, so that's, you know, if you love music and your school requires a, that you take some class in the arts, then that's a chance for you to continue to play the tuba or the trombone or whatever it is. I do think every semester should also have dessert. There should be a class that you are looking forward to during the week. Um, for every student, what makes, what makes you dessert, <laughs> what qualifies as dessert for you is different. Um, my Spanish class was my dessert. I, I looked forward to it, um, not just because uh, my professor taught us vocabulares uh, every Friday, which is useful vocabulary um, for if we went to a discotheque, um, what we would say um, <laughs> and that sort of thing. Um, but it was a class I really looked forward to because it felt functional and helpful. And it was, um, there were regular quizzes. Um, so I knew how I was doing and I was working hard to stay on top of that material. Whereas my history class with Dean Wilson, you know, um, I, I wasn't going to get called on most likely. Um, and, uh, and I didn't have to know everything until halfway through the semester. Um, so that's a little piece of advice is think about it like a a meal and keep it balanced. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, we have a, a, a mom who's got a student who's changed majors several times. Um, I think this is a student who's at a state university and they're having trouble getting into the classes they need for their major. So then they're switching major, switching the major. So do you think that's a student who should leave that college even though they like it or should they like, how do they find a major that they can actually finish? Um, can you talk about some of those challenges? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's a really hard question to answer, not knowing specifics um, about what the options are for this student at that particular school. Um, my feeling is always, if that student has found a place that they really like, if they have found a place where they feel they belong, um, if they have found overall an intellectual and social community that really aligns with them and they resonate with, that um, my hope would be that they could find a major that they could also um, find appealing to them and that would work for them. Um, but if, if it's not a great match, school-wise, which my sense in that question was that that it may be a good match, but if it's not, then I do think that there is makes some sense to transfer. But if you really like the school, um, you know, I, I and, and if you haven't figured this out, I, I do think, you know, from my perspective, the major is secondary um, to all the other things. So I don't know if that answers the question. I don't know if you have a point of view on this, um, Ginger, or not, but that's kind of where I'm coming from. 
I mean, sometimes you just have to be practical about it. Um, part of the reason that I chose psychology as my primary major at Duke was because I was more than halfway finished with the major by accident. Um, those were, the, I had taken those classes because they were interesting to me. So I figured I might as well declare it and finish the major, even though that meant I would have to take biology with Dr. Searles, um, who really did try to inspire me to love seaweed. Um, <laughs> that was his area of, of uh, passionate area of research. Um, and I, made a, I made a D plus in that class. It was not great for me. Um, and, and I was taking it as a junior um, with a lot of people who were like had aced biology and AP biology in high school. And I was like, I don't even remember what the difference of me between mitosis and meiosis. I still don't. Um, and uh, so sometimes it's just practical um, because you got to get her done, um, you know, because you want to get the degree and get on with your life. And so sometimes it's a matter of looking at what can you do. Um, some majors are pretty easy to finish in a short period of time. Um, back in the day, the English major at Duke was only eight classes and you could take Chaucer and Shakespeare at the same time. The order in which you took those classes did not matter. So you could actually finish the whole major in a year if you wanted to. Um, so I think it's okay to also just get your get your degree done yeah. if you're starting to get near you know close to the end and um and use as you were saying before sue some of the things that you're doing outside of class um as a way to identify interests and explore them and you know make the argument in your resume that those are the things that have prepared you um for the professional field that you're that you're choosing um, we've got a, one attendee who um, said that her son was changing from computer science to cybersecurity um, and hoping that that would uh, secure a, a career choice, but he, he's feeling a little nervous about all of the IT layoffs that we've heard about in the news. Um, so can you help us think through that situation? Yeah, I'm not sure I can. Um, actually help think through that situation. Um, there have been certainly an awful lot of IT layoffs. Um, and, you know, that's just going to happen. There are going to be layoffs in certain areas at certain times. And then there's suddenly going to be a resurrection of a particular career that's going to come back. Um, you know, I think, again, if we go back to those seven things, the critical thinking, the problem solving, the reading, the writing, the speaking, the teamwork, the independent study, and the demonstration of success, that is what anyone is going to have to sell to any place. You're not selling your major. The bottom line, and I and I hate to say this, I hope I don't come across in a way that, that I don't want to here. I hope this just doesn't get uh, misinterpreted. But when we graduate from college, we're really not experts in anything. We really don't know that much. We know a little bit about a lot of things and we know a little bit more about something else that we've majored in, but we're really not an expert. And so we're gonna gain that expertise with experience. And what's most important is just being able to graduate, land someplace, get some experience, and then figure it out. That first job is not the most critical job. I would say the most critical job in our lives is our last job, not the first one. Thank you. Um, one of our attendees um, talked about having a son who's really interested in science. Yeah. And I know that was something that was interesting for you. Any tips on sort of how to explore that? I, I think one of the things that I have always noticed is that like careers are at the intersection of things. Um, I, my mom told me that, you know, I loved theater and I loved writing. And she said, somebody writes the playbill, Ginger. Like there's a job in the middle of the things that you're interested in, even if they don't necessarily seem related. Um, but how does somebody go about exploring an interest in science? Um, how do you figure out like what, that's a big category. How do you narrow it down a little bit? Yeah. And, you know, again, I think this is where, um, talking with your professor, getting engaged in some kind of research, um, in college, there's so many opportunities to do things outside the classroom that are directly related to science and trying to figure out, you know, if you if you love high school biology, I will tell you college biology is very different. If you love high school chemistry, college chemistry is very different. And I would say the same about every STEM area, whether it's 
um, science, technology, engineering, or math, the college experience is different. And the only way to really figure all of that out is to explore it, to take a class here and there. And again, I would always um, encourage people to find that professor that they really like, that they can ask questions of, that they can possibly do some research with, and then explore and see if, if there are some connections there. Thank you. One last question um, from someone who is interested in aviation. So yeah. if you have an interest in a field um, like that, a, you know, sort of a, a field that you want to go into professionally, is it important to go to a school like Embry-Riddle where you can just fly planes all day? Um, or should you go somewhere else and explore other interests before? Such a great question. I don't yep. know. <laughs> Such, such a great question. Um, again, I think this is an opportunity. It, you know, the I don't, there's no right answer to that. I, I just don't think there's a right answer. And if you've got a real interest in flying planes and you know that that is an absolute passion um, and it's something that you love to do and you want to do, I say, I say go to an Embry Riddle type school. I think that's what you do. Um, you're going to get some liberal arts while you're there. You're not going to get as much. Um, but I still think that even graduating from there, you're going to be able to use that as a fairly good launch pad for some other things, should the piloting not work out. Thank you. Um, we had one last question um, about a student who's interested in biology and technology and has been wondering, is that, does that mean biotech is the major or biomedical engineering and how to figure out that out? Because those are two different colleges, right? That's often the liberal arts college versus the engineering school. Um, my recommendation would be to do a summer program, um, to do some exploration. Um, you can do a lot of uh, exploration through your local colleges, wherever you are, or you can do a, a, a residential program potentially at a, at a school. Lots of engineering um, programs will have introduction to what engineering is all about. Um, and particularly, this is a young woman who's interested in, in this field and their wise, which is um, women in science and engineering, um, has some really, really terrific programs. Um, so those would be my recommendations. Sue, do you have anything else you'd add? Well, that's a great answer. Um, you know, I, I, I can't help but say this, not necessarily in direct answer to this question, but this question sort of makes me think, and hopefully people have heard us say this, to imagine a 17 or an 18 year old or 30 or a 40 year old to know what they wanna do when they grow up is just unreasonable. So many of us have changed our careers. We've done different things along the way. Um, and I think we just have to make our best choice. Um, we have to make our best decision at the time, um, but not feel as though that decision is gonna lock us in for a lifetime into a, a lifetime of inflexibility because it's not. And we're gonna be able to find those intersections along the way in so many, so many different ways. So we make our best choice. We live with, with it for the short term and hopefully we figure it out in the long term. Thank you so much, Sue. I think that's a perfect way for us to conclude our conversation tonight. I'm grateful um, to our audience for their great questions and their engagement. As a reminder, this uh, recording will be heading your way if you want to review any of it in the future. Um, thank you again for, for joining us, Sue. I'm grateful um, for your advice and your insights always, um, and especially on this topic um, that I know is very near and dear to your heart. And, and whenever... Ginger, you know that I will always do what you want me to do. So <laughs> I've been delighted to do this with you this evening. And I do have to do a shout out to Ginger's mom, Maureen Fay. I know she's watching and it's, um, she makes me nervous. So thank you. <laughs> Well, to all the moms that are out there and the dads and the grandmothers and the guardians and the, the supporters of students, um, their students, these are the people who are cheering for you and they're excited for you and your adventures ahead and whether you had parents who were hopeful about your future but hadn't gone to college and aren't sure really how to help you through navigate this process or you have parents who put you in a onesie from their school the minute you were born and you're trying to figure out how to develop your own path you've got some great adventures ahead of you and whatever you decide to be when you grow up we hope you'll be terrific at it but most importantly that you'll have a terrific time doing it um, thanks so much everybody for joining us and good night bye everybody <laughs>